Cody Leibel here again, thanks for watching. A lot of times we talk about neo-Marxism and we kind of assume that people understand what we're talking about. But it occurred to me that a lot of people have different experiences than I do. You know, I went to public school and public college and so to me, hearing about inclusion and diversity, hearing about feminism and tolerance and homophobia and Islamophobia and all this constellation that has come to be known as intersectional theory or neo-Marxism. This is just like, this is what people talk about. But if you are from a different background or perhaps if you went to school earlier than I did, you know, because I graduated high school in 03, you might have a different experience. And so we need to be clear about what is neo-Marxism that we are trying to combat. What is social justice? What is intersectionality? All these things. So I think that neo-Marxism is the most useful big umbrella term. Neo-Marxism is a viewpoint that looks at the entire world, that analyzes society in terms of groups of oppressors and groups of the oppressed. And you can be an oppressor in multiple ways. So for example, if you happen to be Christian, and if you happen to be white, straight, cisgender, that means you identify with the gender that you are. If you happen to be able-bodied, if you happen to be an adult but not aged, any of these different things all of them, they give you advantages. And the idea of neo-Marxism is that that's just too many advantages, that the, the playing field is not level, that you have an invisible knapsack of privilege. And that because of that, because of your white privilege or Christian privilege, or the family background that you came from as far as your wealth, any number of these qualities about you, it's not fair. And other people just don't have a chance to succeed. This functions on an egalitarian theory of justice in which equal outcomes are the cosmic state of justice. And until we have equal outcomes, something is wrong with the universe. And so cultural norms need to be changed and laws need to be changed in order to level the playing field. Looking to Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech where he talks about how every mountain will be made low and every valley raised up. That's a common idea of what justice would consist of except for there's two different ways to look at that. Are you saying that everybody should be treated equally under the law? That everybody should be left alone so that they can work and succeed? Or are you saying that the government should pass laws, that there's a quota system, that you have to hire a certain number of people of a certain type, that you analyze society in terms of wealth and you, and you compare every variable, the average wealth of people that have this color skin or that identify as this race or something like that, and you do every kind of bivariate analysis, just two variables, and then you say, well, on average, the college attainment or the wealth or whatever good outcome is different in, in this group on aggregate, in this group on aggregate. And therefore, because there's a difference, there is an injustice. You see how, how they're thinking, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's an injustice. I mean, to debunk that real quick, on average, if a white person in the United States were to trace back their ancestry to how long their ancestors have lived in the country, it would be longer than somebody with darker skin, just on average. Just because there's been more immigration more recently from more parts of the world. The amount of time that your family and your grandparents and parents have been in the country is going to have a huge impact on the amount of wealth that you create. I mean, you can't just look at two variables. A bivariate analysis is insufficient to even understand the causality and the trends and stuff like that. But that's what people are doing. They're saying, you know, why are women underrepresented in the tech field? Did it ever concern them that women are also underrepresented in construction? Those inf infrastructure type things? There's, there's all kinds of reasons that are not necessarily limited to people have been treated unfairly by the education system or, or by cultural norms and expectations. It could just be that people chose differently. This simplistic level of analysis that tells us that people are victims if the statistics don't all line up a certain way and that that signals a cosmic injustice. That amounts to a theory that there are oppressors and there are the oppressed. And we prove it simply by pointing to the fact that there are different outcomes. How basic can you be to believe that? But that's what people believe. It's called neo-Marxism because it's kind of like Marxism. Marxism being the idea that there were two different classes. There were the rich class and, and then there were the poor proletariat and that the proletariat needed to rise up and replace the rich. Take what belonged to those and, and say it belongs to us. If your policies that you're advocating today, Democratic Party, look like that, but now it's applied to, across every intersectional variant, well then it's a new kind of Marxism. It's neo-Marxism. 
So that's why these terms intersectionality and neo-Marxism are connected, or victimhood, or oppression, and all, you know, it's all the same thing, it's all the same discussion. They started out by saying we need more tolerance, we need more diversity. But what they really meant was that we want to be intolerant toward anybody that doesn't want to radically work according to our set of policies to include everyone. And by include everyone, we mean redistribute wealth from those who have it in order to pay to include others. You can see how disgusting that is, because they, they called themselves the ones that were pro-toleration and inclusion, but they end up just excluding white, Christian, male, straight, upper class. I mean, there's like a certain, there's a certain demographic that they really hate and that uh, you're just not credible. You're not considered to be a credible source of information or leadership if you fit that, unless you happen to be the highest champion of their ideology. And then, you know, like Beto O'Rourke or somebody like that, then they'll let you in. But it's the ideology that, that's ruling. I mean, you can see this because they say that they want to include lots of people, but, you know, if you happen to be black-skinned, if you happen to be of African ancestry and you're a conservative, then they say, oh, yeah, you're just, you're a token. You're being used by the white man. And, and they'll say other things, too, that are even more insulting. And so the thing is, it's the ideology that rules. And their ideology is, is about painting people as victims and painting other people as oppressors and using the state and social norms in order to bring some down in order to do what they think is going to end up bringing others up. But it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Also, it's wrong. Morally wrong. Even if it could work, it'd be morally unacceptable because what belongs to me belongs to me. Sorry to break it to you. I mean, all these terms, ableism and lookism, ageism, sexism, racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, everything that you hear being talked about, if you turn on the news like MSNBC, morning tonight, if you look at Don Lemon, everything he talks about morning to night. It's all in service of a single worldview. And they wouldn't want you to know that. They just want you to think this is the way people think. This is what's true. This is what's important. We're just good people. But what they all are in service of is an ideological system called neo-Marxism. And that system has infiltrated the church. That's why Judd Saul is creating this film, Enemies Within the Church, to show this ideological system neo-Marxism, infiltrating churches, seminaries, religious organizations, conferences, publishers, all of that, the whole industry, and to show that, in fact, the industry is promoting these ideas. We're just going to show it. Just going just gonna to connect the dots so that in case you didn't know, you can see that this is what's happening. You need to know about it because it's the spirit of the age. It's the spirit of the world in which we live, and that spirit is warring against the church, and it wants to take over the church. And in many churches, it will. I hate to break it to you, but that's just going to happen. It will. Be aware of it. Protect your church. Find out how you can. If you're not already a, a part of the team, go to facebook.com slash groups slash enemies within, and you'll see everything about how to join. We already have more than a thousand team members, and we're going to raise that number substantially in the next couple of weeks. The point is to fight back against this spirit of the age that is taking over in our churches. To equip believers and how they can stand up for the truth and help their pastor stand up for the truth. So if you're befuddled by all these terms, that's okay. I, I, hopefully I laid out a couple of ideas about how they relate and what they really mean, but it's all the same thing. It's just leftism, it's just progressivism, it's just socialism, social justice. That's what they're talking about. I have a big problem with the term social justice because it suggests that there's something that is justice in the social sphere that's not legal justice. And that's a lie. There's only one kind of justice in, in the social sphere, and that's legal justice. I mean, unless you're talking about just gratitude. Like, yeah, I'm grateful to Steve Jobs for inventing the iPhone or something like that. That's, that's I suppose, it's justice among people. But, but they're trying to say it's something different. And it always boils down to they desire to get the government involved. They desire to make policy. and. I mean, they're dishonest about it. They're slippery snakes. So two years ago, if you would have said, oh, you're talking about social justice, are you sure you're not just talking about socialism? They'd say, why do you always talk about the government? It's not about the government. We're not talking about making laws. You know, Tim Keller saying, we just believe that justice is charity and charity is justice. We're not trying to make laws. 
Well, when have these people ever stood up against socialism and said it's wrong? Well, as the months go by, it turns out that they are promoting it. And now we've got calls for redistribution of wealth based on race, under the guise of racial reparations for something that happened more than 100 years ago between people that are, I mean, some, some people's ancestors were involved. A lot of people in the United States, their ancestors weren't even involved. And it's all just a farce. They don't really believe that it's necessary to repay the, the descendants of slaves. What they really believe is that people living today have been harmed by living in a society that is oppressive to them. People today, that's really what they believe. And it's only on this egalitarian worldview, it's only on this collectivist worldview that they can justify it. The good that they seek to achieve is egalitarian outcomes. Everybody has the same amount of wealth and success, or approximately so, as much as we can create. Look up John Rawls' Theory of Justice if you want to know the playbook for this. That's the goal that they're seeking, is egalitarian cosmic justice. And the means? Redistribution of wealth through the government. That's what it's always been about. Take a stand. Stand up in your church. Stand up on Facebook or on Twitter or in your blog or in your video. If you're a preacher, preach the word. Go to Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Talk to people about who owns what and why. Go to Romans 13. Tell people what is being talked about in the world today under the guise of social justice or these other intersectional neo-Marxist ideas. Tell people why it's wrong and what the alternative is because your people are hungry to know God's answers and God has them. And if you don't know that, you're not doing your job. And if your people don't know that, you're not doing your job. You can be a happy warrior. You can be a champion of truth. I'm afraid that too often we say to ourselves, I have to be a warrior at the expense of being happy or I have to be happy at the expense of being a warrior. But I think that the happy life is the life that includes both. Thanks for listening.